And welcome, folks, to another edition of the Michigan Football Breakdown. Focus on the defense with that man, Vance, who walking around Houston. People knew who Vance Bedford was. Were you surprised, Vance, that you were walking around there like, hey, Coach Bedford? It was crazy. I, I, I'm shocked, man. We went to the, the team hotel and people walking up and saying, watch the show. There's one gentleman. Here's from Jordan in the Middle East. So he watches the show all the time. I'm like, what? And, and Jordan said, oh, so I don't miss the show. And another person say, I look at it with my, my son. And my son understands football. Could you guys make it so simple? I mean, I was amazed. I was truly, truly amazed and felt blessed by it. I mean, so it's been a lot of fun and people starting to check us out. Yeah, man. It, 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 you, get a, you get a different appreciation for how much people love the show when you see them in person. And they can, they can lay out things you said on the show, things you covered on the show. And then they come back and they're like, man, Coach Bedford knew exactly what they were going to do against Bama. Coach Bedford knew exactly what they were going to do against Washington. Because when I say you and Al, the, the previews that you guys did for Ohio State and especially, especially for the Rose Bowl and the championship game, Vance, it was like y'all weren't retired. Now, I know. See, this was this what's going on right now. And you, you know I'm not lying when I say this. People are watching you on this breakdown, and they all say, oh, man, I need to get Vance come work for me. I need to get Vance come be an analyst for me. I need to get Vance come be on my staff. Am, am I lying, Vance? Are you not having coaches saying, I want you to come work for me right now? I've had a little bit of that, but I don't have an interest. I mean, I'm retired. I mean, I'm, I'm still in use of my dad's 91, and I tell you what, he spent five nights with me here in my little condo, and uh, that's that's been a blessing. So, no, nah, I'm not interested in going to work. I mean, people make those calls. And one of my former Michigan guys, Jim Herman, got a head job over in Europe offered me a job. i like, I'm retired, bro. He said, I, you got to April. Don't worry about it. And, uh, and I appreciate him giving me a call. But like I said, I'm retired for a reason. Yeah, it's a whole bunch of people say, hey, Vance needs to come back and be an analyst for Michigan. I was like, do you un- the man is retired. He go be a uh, uh, he could go be a staff member in the NFL right now. Everyone, but my point in bringing it up is not that you're gonna go take a job. It's that they're watching and they're saying, "Man, this dude is on it." Because Vance, when I say you, you called it big time about how they were gonna get after, how they were gonna get after Michael Penix, how they were gonna confuse him, and this was a great point. You taught, I mean, you te- teach me stuff all the time. But one of the most poignant things that you you taught you, you you taught me about was like, look, confusion in coverages is not just about the quarterback. It's about confusing the receivers too. Mm-hmm. And that has that's that that confusion on both fronts has played a large part in, in Michigan's success. And one of the things, one of the one of the guys told me after the game, Vance, they had 30 coverage variations in this game. 30 <laughs> coverage variations in the game. I mean, this is really complex stuff. They had a couple of busts, and it seemed like the only time they were really getting loose or getting open was when Michigan busted. Now, you got 30 coverage var- variations, Coach Bedford. There's going to be some busts out there, right? Well, you know, the same. They had two busts that one play was called back because of a holding. Another one they completed. It was similar to the same coverage they ran versus Ohio State, but they were doubling Marvel. And what, what Washington did, they motioned to stack splits, and it caused some confusion. If you go back to Ohio State, they did the same thing with Marvin. He caught that deep one down the sideline. Almost the same identical situation, and Washington only did it twice the whole ballgame. Mm-hmm. I mean, and they're a big motion, trade, shift team, that type of thing. But I'm, I'm happy we didn't see more of that. I really am. And I tell people all the time, you know, everybody talk about Nick Saban and what he does. Jesse Minner has the best scheme I've seen since I left the NFL. It's not even close. And the kids do a great job adjusting, making checks. I mean, it's just just amazing. I mean, and remember. Wait, 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 let's, let's hone in on that. So the best scheme that you've seen in college football. So the best scheme you've seen since you left the NFL, and we got we had some defensive guys. I and mean, Nick Saban is is renowned as the defensive guru 
And you're saying the best scheme that you have seen since leaving the NFL and coming back to college football is Jesse Minton. They do a great job with coverages, adjustments. When, when you talk about Nick Saban, first of all, they got the best players in the country. Let's just make the point to that. And he is a matchup guy. In other words, it's, it's, you come in my area, you lock down right now. So every zone looks like man to man, how they play it. And when we played uh, Alabama, the reason Nick said he was confused because we huddled up. We came out on the ball with 15 seconds so he couldn't make a check. He does everything from the sideline. They make a lot of checks. Well, when you look at Jesse Menner's defense, the checks are already installed. If you watch that game closely, those guys, the secondary linebackers, they were looking at each other, making checks, making corrections, adjustments. And I don't see a lot of football teams doing that. I really don't. I mean, so you got to have smart kids to do it, but then you got to have coaches who believe they can teach it. And they did a tremendous job in getting that taught. Like I said, I'm very impressed with what they're doing. Remember, let's go back two years ago when Jesse became the coordinator. I said, he got to be a secondary coach. Remember I said that? I do. You did. Because they were doing different things from what Coach McDonald was doing. The, the, the system was the same, but the coverages were a little bit more complex. I mean, I recognize that right away. And uh, it shows up with the adjustments he makes throughout the week. I mean, just absolutely, it's, it's amazing what he has accomplished. He's done a tremendous yeah. job. Yeah, he's he's on a different level. And, you know, I, I talked to Mike Elston. I got a message for, from, from Mike Elston for you. But he said, you know, I, I was talking to him about how he attacks protections. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's, there's just, like, you, these teams have different protections. He, like, he can attack protections like no coach I've seen. He's bringing guys free all the time. And so Mike said it's not just that. He said, no, he said he's a lead at that. But he said he's the best I've seen at making the right call and the right, like, he, he can watch a game. He can get the feel of the game. And get a feel for what works, and know when the call, when the right, make the right play call to make make a difference. I'm there. He's the best I've ever been around in that regard. Because I mean, Vance, you know, all these guys know defense, but when you call, when you make a call, is what it's all about, right? And so he said, this dude's the best he's ever seen. He has and a great feel for the game, making adjustments. I mean, he does a great job studying a video. I'm going to go back to his dad, Rick Mena. I first met his dad back in 1990. I was working at Colorado State. Now D.C. left to go to Boston College. We interviewed Rick. And Rick was, had computer printouts back in 1990. Well, that wasn't even a hot thing back then. So Rick was ahead of the game back in 1990. So now let's move forward to his son. His son grew up around this stuff. His dad been a coordinator, a head coach, coach the NFL. He's been around some great coaches, and he learned from his dad. And I tell you what, he is even better than what his father is as far as coaching, a feel for the game, making game time adjustments. Not everybody can do that. You can have a feel for it, but he, like you said, he makes adjustments, makes the right call at the right time. I mean, like I said, very impressed. I'm very impressed. All right, let me share this with you, Vance. Let me share this Chrome tab and uh, give me a thumbs up if you can hear it. What okay. makes you hear it, Vance? Give me. So here we go. Coach, you got to do me a favor first. Okay. You got to tell my man Vance Bedford I said hello. Out, man. Vance shouts you out on every episode. <laughs> He's my every guy, episode. man. You're his guy, too. And one of the things. Yeah, so he, hey, man, he said, hey, tell my man Vance Bedford. I said, what's up? Uh, clearly he watches, man. <laughs> hey, they all say they don't, but they do. They all say they don't, but I already know they do. He be Coach Clint. He, he watches too because he came to you that one time and said, Vance don't like what we're doing secondary wise. So they all watch and they be lying. Now I don't look at it. Yeah, you do. Yes, you do. Because even Coach Harbaugh looked at it, gave us some props. So yeah, I'm gonna look at it to see what's going on and see if I'm on point. Don't kid yourself. They go back home in the closet, put on, a, go to YouTube, uh, the Michigan Inside, and check us out. I'm all good. Right. And so here's the thing, and this ought to tell you a lot, because people's like, "Oh man, y'all are too accurate. You you giving the you giving the the opposition tips, man. If them dudes can't watch." themselves and break down what we break down on youtube they in trouble they, they're in trouble man so hey, all we doing we giving it it's like when you're in the second third grade and they teach arithmetic 
long division back when I was a kid growing up, they don't teach that anymore. How to do a rhythm of um, uh, two plus two equal four, then you go to the timetable. That's how simple the game actually is when you look at it. Now, to take it to the next step, that's Jesse has done that, is that now he is doing more things with it. But the game is simple to recognize things, but to make the right calls at the right time, Jesse has a great feel for that. Like I say, I am truly, truly impressed. Man, people are like best game since you have left the NFL or college. That's man. And and he was echoing if, if folks didn't watch that interview, that whole interview with Mike Elston, he was like, Man, you know, I should find that that portion in the uh in the um uh, the episode where he was or that interview where he was like, Man, Jesse Mentor, let me go ahead and bring that up real quick. Um, so folks can hear that portion. All right, I'm going to share this right here. Share this Chrome tab. And boom, let's get back to old. <laughs> the way you guys attack protections is elite. It's elite. You're, you're springing guys free on a weekly basis. And I, I just wonder, you know, from a, from a coaching perspective, working with him, your impressions of, of how – how the, how different his skill is when it comes to that part of the game. Yeah, I do want to give a shout out to Coach Miller because I think he's the best defense coordinator in the country. And I think what makes him the best is the timing of some of his defensive play calls on game day. There's a lot of guys that have a great mind, that have great scheme, that can draw up a great plan. But his ability to dial up the defense when it's needed at the right moment, at the right time, is on hand. And um, I've never worked with a guy like him that's able to do that. So kudos to him. Um, I think everybody everybody is uh, has their, their footprint on their, their fingerprint on this defense, from Coach Plink Scales to Jay Harbaugh. Um, you know, Dylan Roney, all of our guys that are in that room, the minds that are in that room are phenomenal. We work well together. There's an unselfishness there um, that we preach, that Coach Harbaugh preaches, that everybody buys into, and it leads right into the football team and the players. Yeah, man. And so there you go, Vance. You know, this. you aren't the only one saying, man, that Jesse Mendes, the best. I, he, he coached a lot of football for a long time. He said, this is the best dude I've ever been around in that regard. Yeah, because Mike's been with uh, Greg Madison, who I was working with in 95, 96, and we've spoken over the years. He was with the Baltimore Ravens, too. And uh, I thought Greg was pretty sharp. Jim Herman. Jim Herman was uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the de defensive play coach of the year in 97 when he won it all. Jim was a very sharp and aware guy. And so I've been around some, some really good coaches, but to watch Jesse call a game, the feel he has for the game, it is very uncanny. Having the guys in the right time. If you go back to, I said, for the Washington game, don't be surprised if several of the things from Ohio State game shows up. The last interception little Mike had against Ohio State, they were in the same coverage and got an interception at the end. Same, same coverage. So he brought that game plan, some of it, to this particular ball game, and it paid dividends. It's like Washington had no clue that he was going to do that. But the problem they had, the D-line now, I'll tell you what, mm -hmm. I got I got blowback from people from the University of Texas because I was praising Michigan's defense so much, and especially D-line. I talk about Texas D-line. They can't rush the pass. The people got upset. I really don't care because I just shoot the truth anyhow. But like my daddy would tell me, he said, when you watch Michigan's D-line, they have great feet. They never on the ground. And they sac sacrifice themselves with whatever stunt it is. I mean, so in the name of the game, if you're going to make a sacrifice for the benefit of everyone else, they don't bought into what he's doing. Because a lot of times they don't happen. I was at a high school this morning talking to some coaches. I was on the board. And I was talking about how Michigan does things and how these kids buy in. And they do their job to a close to perfection as you can find. A lot of times kids don't do this. They say, well, coach, I saw this. No, I'd say, no, you didn't. Mm -hmm. You got one job to get right here. And I see that every single week with the Michigan defense, really, for the past three years. Well, you said, again, if you weren't paying attention to these the previews, you, you're you missing out. You said, man, they're going to they're gonna abuse that. The, the center is in trouble in this game. And Vance, they they had that dude on skates. They are tossing him around like a rag doll in there. Well, you take a, you find somebody weak and inside was weak. The tackles were big and long, but they could be handled by speed rush. But no quarterback like pressure up the middle. And I felt like, are we going to do anything with success? 
I mean, right down the quarterback's face. And I'll tell you what, the quarterback was shook. I'm just being honest. He was shook, but you know what? Think about this, Sam. He was, I think, what, three or four years in Indiana? Mm-hmm. He remembers the abuse <laughs> he took. See, that don't ever go away, Sam. That was in the back of his head that how he was abused when he played Michigan. You don't forget those things, Sam. So we start the ball game, and we get out to him early. All of a sudden, he started having flashbacks, which is nothing but a, more than a nightmare with your eyes open. And so part of it was over with, Sam. He was scared to death. They could say what they wanted to say. That's part of it. Yeah, man. It is. It is definitely, definitely uh, a, 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 a great time. A great time when you talk about the, the, the coaching expertise that is in, in that building. And I want to shout a guy out who people might not know what he's doing behind the scenes because he, he's an analyst with all these coaches are trying to get Vance to do. Imagine Vance Beffer was an analyst for this team. You know, you, you know he would be having an influence. Like, you know that. You can tell. Like, this dude, his defensive mind is, like, top-notch. Well, you talk to the coaches, the defensive coaches on that staff, any of the coaches on that staff, and they say, Doug Mallory, when it comes to their coverage variations from week to week, play a very significant role. Like, you know, devil's advocate, hey, this is what they're going to try to do. We come with this coverage, this is what they're going to try to do. Or this is a way that we can kind of attack this particular offense. So as they change things around from week to week, you know, those, those analysts, a lot, those, a lot of those guys, it's not just a stop gap just to get another job. Like this dude was making a difference. And all those coaches will tell you that Vance. You know, Doug's been coaching for a long time. He's been in the NFL. So he brings a wealth of knowledge to the game. I mean, again, anytime you go to the NFL and you have to deal with those receivers and quarterbacks up there, when you come back to college, it's a lot easier to be honest. And to bring that depth and that mindset to what they were already doing. Because the first thing you do as an analyst, this is how they should attack you and beat you right now. So I'm going to break down how to attack our defense. And then after that, you start making adjustments to compensate for that. And I think Doug is that great guy. Like I said, a devil's advocate, that's, that's what a, a good analyst should do. Mm-hmm. He brings that wealth of knowledge to the table. If you Now, this is what you're probably going to see. This is how they're probably going to attack you. So we should be doing this right here. To take that away. And I think that's a plus. So you you actually have four secondary coaches on that staff, you think about it. Makes a huge difference because now when you start talking and the conversations could be so in depth because of different knowledges from different areas, and all of a sudden you put that t- together and just mold one perfect situation, you get an undefeated season and a national championship. Yeah. You you also said in a different I yeah, said, so how do you affect <laughs> How do you affect the quarterback who's getting rid of the ball quickly? And you said, you know, you're going to have to – if Mich- you aren't a, a big press team, Michigan wasn't a big press team, but you say they're, they're trying to do something that, but the receivers are moving around a lot. They're making it hard for you to press them. You know, vary your coverages and, you know, your, your pre- get pressure. You don't always have to get the sack, but get pressure. And they bothered him, Vance. They, they really, as, as someone said in the, uh, in the chat, Jay Marion said, yeah, Penix didn't want no more. He thought this was Michigan from 2020. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. See, <laughs> hey, Sam, I, I'm being honest now for a quarterback. And as great as Tom Brady was, the year when they played the Broncos, and that's year the Broncos won a championship, he never had a chance. Brady was shook because of the pressure. So – as mentally tough as, as as Tom was, that pressure gets to you. And nothing with my man Penix, but he not no break. And, and the pressure we had, he hadn't seen pressure like that the entire year. And, and I felt like our D-line had a really good chance on the inside, which they did. I mean, one time, I mean, my man grabbed that guard and walked him back. I was like, oh, my goodness, this game is over with. I see, we playing ball because – and they went to the West Coast concept. Quick passing game. They went to screens. And for the most part, we took that away. We tackled that for minimal gains. And when you can do that, all of a sudden, it's third and long. I tell you what, Jesse bring it all out now. They had no idea where the pressure was coming back. Yeah, man. So that's something to talk about real quick, Vance. Like, you've you got to have a lot of trust. And, you know, the, the open field tackling that was on display in that game by the Michigan defense 
was elite. The ones that stick out to me, I, you know, I know Mikey made a big one in the open field. Was a junior who had one? But the, the biggest one of the game to me was Will Johnson. I mean, it was zero. And it's Will and the receiver on an out of advance. And he does not make that tackle. It's a t- it's a, like a 50, 60-yard touchdown. It's a touchdown. And Will brought my man down to open field. And they were doing that the whole game. And you got to have athletes. But I'll tell you what, you have to work on in a practice. As well as that defense, the entire defense plays week in and week out. They must spend quite a bit of time on tackling. Because it's a fundamental that you can improve on. And a lot of people talk that game, but when I watch Michigan, I see it. I see what they do in practice, carry it to the game. It's great success. If you go back the entire year, remember, let's go back to about the third game when we had a couple of missed tackles. If I go back to I say, these guys are going to be rusty, Sam. They've been sitting out. And those guys that have been rusty, they missed some plays, missed some tackles, but led to big plays. As the season progressed, that rust kind of went to the side, and you can see them getting better and better each week. So I just go back to how they practice, the things they do in practice, and it pays dividends in, in the game. And that's what's important. A lot of times, coaches, they talk that game, but they don't actually work it in practice. Mm-hmm. Clearly, this squad does. So we're, going, we're about to get to the questions for you, Vance. But before we do, we let, let's start talking hardball. Ooh. Let's start talking the, the NFL, Vance. Um, clearly. The, there's there's interest. And, you know, the interesting thing to me is how over the past couple of years, I know you know a lot of dudes in the league, a lot of coaches in the league, and you, you've talked to them about all the buzz in past years about Harbaugh and how that buzz, like, so media's talking about it. We're talking about it on social media, Twitter, and all that. But you guys, it's like, man, what are you? They were almost laugh at me. When I be asking questions about this team and that team and this team and the agent, same thing like, man, all these teams you asking me about, like he's not in the mix for those jobs. But it was always at least when you had the Minnesota at the end of the cycle in 21, Denver showed a lot of strong interest last year. But finally this year, the buzz and the level of actual interest seems to be like it seemed like all those questions that teams had about Jim Harbaugh, they, they, those questions aren't as big anymore. It isn't. I mean, right now, so many jobs open. There are eight jobs open right now in the National Football League. It was eight where you got New England's been, they hired their guy. Uh, the Chargers, I think, is, is a real situation. And I was told years ago when I first went to the NFL that if you go to, to a team that didn't have a quarterback, you're going to be fired in two or three years. Mm-hmm. Well, the Chargers, they got a real deal quarterback. And he's a West, his wife's a West Coast guy. So I know people are blowing up the AD and everybody else for a contract. It's not about the AD. It's about what Jim wanted to do. Jim wanted to come back to Michigan, put him back on top. He beat Ohio State three times, three conference championships, the national championship. He has accomplished the goals that he wanted to accomplish for Michigan now. The next step is he wanted to win the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. So the opportunities right now present themselves to him. He's looking for the best option for himself. And if he can get the Chargers job, and the money's right, it's a good chance he's going to do that. And the biggest thing with the Chargers is a salary cap. They're over the salary cap. They have three guys that make $30 million. That's $90 million of the salary cap. And I take it back, and, and you throw the quarterback in there, he's making 40 so you got four guys over uh, over $120,000 almost. Mm-hmm. And so that limits what you can do with your roster. They got to get down, number one, by letting some guys go. So he's looking at that. The next situation are going to be the Raiders. If they don't hire Antonio Pierce. Hold on, Vance. I got something to show you. They got into, they already hired him? Right here, right now. Share this with you on the screen. Breaking news. Got it. Raiders are working to finalize a deal to hire Antonio Pierce as their head coach. Per sources, this is according to Michigan man Adam Schefter. Okay. There's Raiders made Pierce their interim head coach on Halloween night. And now are closing in on making it a full-time job. Players who campaign for Pierce soon are expected to be happy. So it looks well, like that's one going there. So and Atlanta's gonna hire uh Belichick. Belichick. <clears throat> so right now it's getting smaller and smaller the window on places that he might want to go. And I think it's gonna be the Chargers. Now, I don't know what's going on with the contract of Michigan. If they set it up where the NCAA said we don't come in and suspend uh Jim for uh, uh half the season. And they hit him with a, a show cause. As long as he said, you guarantee I'm not going to get fired. It's a, it's a chance he could come back. But I personally think 
that he does want to go to the NFL and prove that he's as good as his brother who went to the Super Bowl, who beat him in a Super Bowl years ago. And if he does that, every place he's been, he's won a championship. And I think that's something he would like to do, you know, but it has to be the right situation for him. Yeah, and I, you know, he's in a, a great situation. Like I said, with uh, with Al, he's a great situation with with Michigan. He's about to be the highest paid coach in college football. <coughs> I can't see, excuse me, <clears throat> I can't see a scenario where they have no four cause language in the contract. But is can they come up with something that he's more comfortable with? I'm gonna give you this story. You guys, everybody know who Nick Saban is, correct? Mm-hmm. When Nick signed with Alabama, he had written in his contract, recruiting violations or anything else, it doesn't matter. His contract was guaranteed. <laughs> think, think what I just said. Uh-huh. They can sit back and say, well, that's not true. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's true. So Michigan can do the same thing. So Nick, when he went in there saying, the things happen, I still got a job right. and I still get my money. So – as a university, you can do whatever you choose to do, and your lawyers can fight it. Because right now, the NCAA is being sued by eight different states and 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 somebody else. Right now, the NCAA is on its last leg. And yeah, so so, they're gonna be out the way anyhow sooner or later. It's gonna probably be sooner or later unless they get the act straight. Yeah, see, and that to me would be the kind of compromise that I'm talking about. Like you mm-hmm. could say, okay, any sort of NCAA violations, we gonna say, you know what? You can't get fired for an NCAA violation. That's not hard. To, to me, that's not hard, Sam. You're right. Yeah, and that's not. That's But that'd be a compromise. That's different from saying, okay, no four-cause language. Because if you have no four-cause language, now you can go out and do it like you can be Hugh Free. Be freaky you dick. can't do that because oh, NCAA okay. put a show cause on you. They tell you right now you can't go on the road to recruit, but you can re- recruit on campus. So if he got a show cause, that means he couldn't go off campus. Okay. In most okay. places, when you get a show cause, most universities, they will fire you. Okay. But if I'm the University of Michigan, or Alabama, or Texas, whomever, it's up to the AD and to the, the powers that be, whether it be the president or the board, or whomever it is, they can they can set that contract however they choose to do. That goes above the AD. The AD didn't have that authority. He has to go to the president. The president got to go to the other, the other people. And they have to make that decision. Then it comes back down to the AD. Say, hey, go ahead and get that done. And, and to me, it's up to those people to make that decision. Everybody's going on board, but it's a lot more detail than that. So if they are willing to do that, it's a good chance, based on what San Diego is or is not doing, that he could come back. But I really believe that he wants to try to win the Super Bowl. I think that if he does that, he'll walk away from football. Yeah, man, it shall be interesting to see how all of that breaks down. Now, let's let's assume for the sake of argument that he did go to the church. Whether he goes or, or doesn't go to the church, I think he's going to have a hard time keeping a Jesse mentor. That's going to be tough. That's going to be very, very tough. So do, do you feel like you got to go in the Ravens tree again? To, to make sure that you can stay in this mix? Or can you go outside of that tree and bring in a coordinator that can run this scheme? How do you feel? You, you've you been a coordinator. How do you feel about that? You can do that. Go to that Ravens tree and stay in the same system. I mean, to bring a guy in who has not been in that system, he's going to have some issues learning it. The, the terminology is simpler for the players from that standpoint. But now that guy has to come in and learn something totally different the verbiage and everything else is not necessarily the easiest thing to do, but he would have the spring to do it. But if you look at the season coming up this coming year, he's going to have a tough schedule. And that could slow him down, especially on game day, making adjustments. Because he's not as familiar with that particular scheme to make those adjustments. Because the name of the game is on game day, making adjustments more than anything else. You got the base defense in there, but as the game goes on, you have to make game time adjustments to have success. And so you can go try to get that same tree or bring a coach in to learn that system. All that is great, but if they don't know the system, it takes time to learn that system. And let's say that Harbaugh doesn't go. <coughs> Excuse me, my allergies is acting up. And Jesse goes to the league. He's probably going to go back to his brother so I get another guy from right there. That's what he's going to try to do more or less than, than anything else. 
said, who do you have on your staff right now that can come in here? We've got a lot of guys already intact to know the system. You know, one, yeah. of the things that, one of the things I know was on the table when he went and got Jesse, um, you know, was, you know, was to to do a um, a Clink Elston combo mm -hmm. at, at at DC. So, uh, you know, we we've seen him do split play callers on offense. Can that work on defense? No, I, I'm not a split play caller guy. I've been around guys on offense who does that, and they go real slow calling plays. They really do because now who has a run game, who has a pass game? When do you call this? When do you call that? On game day, only one guy can call. You could have a guy making suggestions and think about this or say, I'm a passing game coordinator, so we're getting third down. He kind of say, hey, these are calls we got to have. But uh, having two play callers, I, I, I struggle with that because mm -hmm. that one guy has a feel for the game. You're calling the game based off of what you worked on, the adjustments you got to make during the game. Then it's a feel thing. Like, you just heard Mike Elson say, here's a guy who's uncanny. And call them defenses. Okay, if it's two guys trying to make calls, he can't be uncanny anymore. Like mm -hmm. I always tell you, as people use the term common sense, they should say nonsense. There's more nonsense out there than common sense. Common sense is rare. I mean, so the combination, I, I, I can't buy into that. One guy on game day has to be that guy. You know, on third down, the other guy can come in and help with suggestions and calls, but otherwise than that, it's got to be one guy. All right. Folks, if you have questions for Vance, drop them in the chat right now and we'll start getting in the q a so you can um you can ask vance what you want to ask him about the national championship game about uh specific players because here's the thing vance you look at this defense yeah they got a tough schedule defense is losing a lot they're losing little mike well, mikey saying Ristol is one of the best play he's one of the best michigan defenders they've ever had that's not hyperbole. I didn't see that when, when the switch was made, but that's what he developed into, and you're losing Junior Colson. But you bring him back a lot, Vance, and there's reason to think that you could be as good next year even with those losses. The depth not there. They played a lot of guys. They stayed fresh, which paid dividends in the fourth quarter because they weren't playing 70 plays a game. They were playing about 40 plays a game. And so if you go into the fourth quarter and you only had 30 snaps, you got a chance. And so they built depth, which also if a guy we, we saw guys get injured throughout the year and really didn't miss, miss a beat. The only issue we had, I thought, was a linebacker. I mean, the depth, the quality of the guys at that time were not as good as our two starters. Mm -hmm. But the initial starters you have coming back defensively, except for your nickelback, little Mikey, I think you played the other kid, came in and played, did a good job. You're losing some of that leadership too. See, that so here's what, they're, here's what I think they're going to do, Vance, because – so. Page number seven is coming back for his fifth year. Rod Moore is coming back. And then number three, Keon Sab, who really came on during the year. So now you can play number seven and number three, Sab and, and or uh, Makari and, and Keon at the safeties. And remember, Rod Moore started out as a nickel. Yeah. I think Rod Moore is going to be the nickel next year. Be a, he's going to be a physical guy. He'll do some good things. So you got, you got a good group coming back. You don't know how to depth. And you're hoping some of these other guys show up and give them the same depth. And my biggest issue is going to be linebacker and can the nickelback show up and play. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, so, that, so they got two really good candidates. Now, Rod, he was banged up this year, but he was tracking. He thought he was going to have a good enough season to go to the league. You know, So if he can stay healthy, slide back into that nickel spot, he knows the defense. He can cover at that spot. Be interesting to see what he can provide. And then – the kid they just got from Maryland, Jay Sean Barham, that transfer. I think he is a. I think he's every bit the talent that Junior Colson is. Okay. Uh, and so, and, and you can. And the thing about him is he'll be involved in the rush game. Like they, they, I know when they got him, they were thinking about okay, we can use this the guy off the edge too. Like I, I think, I think they see him and what they were doing with him in Maryland, saying we could do even more. With, with him than maybe we were doing with our linebackers, and I think that's what they're going to do with, with Barham. Boy, that's hard, that's hard for me to see. I mean, you remember what game was that? Might have been the Maryland game when Barrett went out because he was hurt. Remember that? And, mm -hmm. and about the two plays that he hit a big play because the linebacker was in the wrong spot. Mm -hmm. And they had to get Barrett back in there just for that stability. 
and, and that's what I'm talking about. These get the linebackers, they've been in the same system for three years. Yeah. They play better this year than they did last year. It wasn't even yeah. close, it was like night and day. And yeah. that comes with experience, understanding the system, bringing a guy in from the outside to learn the system, the fit, the terminology. It's not, it's not that easy sometimes. It took these guys three years to get to the point where they are, to play how they play, to be in the right places, to play smart, to play fast. It didn't happen overnight. It took time. And that's all I'm saying about bringing a guy in from the outside. It takes time. It really does. And Wallace came on and did a great job at corner because I was on him early. Mm-hmm. And, and a couple a couple of games, I forgot, they had to put him on the bench because he was getting, I mean, it's like toast. And it, it wouldn't even burn. It just, the wind blew and fell apart. That's how bad it was. <laughs> As the season went on, he started stepping to the plate and he started understanding what the defense was about and what his assignments and responsibilities were. But it took him some time. And at corner, it's a lot easier to learn those things than playing linebacker because things happen real fast at linebacker. It's a totally different game up there. Like yeah, it. and to your point, to the point that you're making, Ernest Hausman, the kid they got from Nebraska last year, linebacker, uh, he came in. He had a, you know, he made some plays this year, but not, you know, he wasn't the, you know, the the force over the course of the season that he had been in Nebraska because because it's a transition year. And I think the expectation is that his game can take a, a big step up this year as a replacement for Mike Barrett. But here's the thing. To your point about Barham, he's going to have that adjustment period yes, he is. coming over from, from Maryland. So, you know, we'll, we'll have to see how that, how quickly he can make that adjustment to a to a defense that they do a whole lot. That's because you just said, I mean, you know, not everyone can coach all of that. Mm-mm. That's not easy to do. I I was at a high school uh, last week talking to a different group of coaches. And talking about zone pressures three underneath, I was just like match up playing basketball three on three. And the coach made this comment, well, you know, our kids can't learn it. When a coach said a kid can't learn it, that means he can't teach it. It's a difference. And that's just how I feel about it. Because to say that without even trying, that means yeah. you can't teach it or you don't want to work at it. So you have a coaching staff there right now that can flat out teach. I'm giving them an A plus. I'm giving them a gold star, the whole bag of tricks. And if you walk up there with confidence, the kids are buying to you. If you walk up in there with your shoulders drooping down like you're not sure, well, guess what? They're not sure. And that coaching staff, they positive. You know, I went to the team hotel. I had a chance to talk to Mike Elston and Hart and Fred Jackson, Sharon Moore. You know, a couple of those guys, man, they were ready to go. I talked to Fred. Fred said, hey, we're going to run through these guys. <laughs> and uh, Sharon Moore said the same thing. Say, hey, he said, man. We're going to run through these guys. We're going to trade. We're going to shift. We're going to get angles on them. We're going to pound them right down the middle. And guess what? Everything that both of them guys told me, I was sitting back at that border boy show. They told me it's going to run through these guys. That they did. Because I, I was there for about I was there for about four hours at the whole team hotel and uh, just talking to those guys. Man, They were confident. Now. They were confident. You know, Mike Elston, he was like, El, we're going to get after these guys. We, we can beat these guys up front. And everything those guys said, I saw every bit of it. And, and to be clear, Vance talked with them after he did the preview, not before. So everything he gave you in the preview that you saw in the game, he said that before talking to the coaches. Yep. So he was just on it like that. Let me just shout out my man who had a get, great game plan and, and called exactly what those guys were going to do in the game, and they did it, Vance. They, 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 they bothered Penix, you know, made him nervous, made him antsy back there. You know, they they had some decent runs in there, but they didn't really run the football on much. They could not block those interior guys, Ooh. confuse them in the secondary. It was a great game plan. You know what I don't understand, though, Sam? If I was the University of Washington staff, the only game you had that you could actually study how they might defend you was Ohio State. And what they did to Marvin, how they rolled up on them, gave them different from quarters, quarter, quarter, half, rolling the clouds this side to a double. How could you not – think they were going to do some of the same things to you. Mm-hmm. Watching the game, it appeared to me they had no idea that that was going to happen. So it kind of baffles me. That was the only team in the conference that looked a little bit like what you might do. And then I'd have gone back to the previous year versus Ohio State. Because that's the only teams that talent-wise could match up with you. And watching the game, I got to be honest, I didn't see that from the University of Washington. 
Mm -hmm. I was really disappointed on what they tried to do. I knew they were going to go to the quick passing game. I knew that they were going to do that, but they weren't patient enough. And we did a great job on most of the screens. I mean, because the Texas, Texas was just, they just bad. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm still, because remember <laughs> I was talking about whatever you do, Sam, don't let the receivers wear outside. Uh -huh. We didn't let them outside, Sam. They got, maybe got one time. They tried a bunch, but only got outside one time. And I watched Texas. They got outside just when they walked through the door. Are we going outside? Okay, go ahead and go. I mean, so when I go back to coaching, they went and defended the things they had to to have success. And again, everybody can't do that. And I give my hats off to the staff at the University of Michigan and to the players who took what they learned and took it to the field on game day. And again, they made an A on the test. Yeah. They were outstanding. All right, let's go ahead and start getting to some of the questions for Vance. I want to let you guys know. The film study is coming up on my film study with Al and the film study with Vance coming up on Monday. Want to thank you for the support. I uh, got a guy in the chat who said he he did. He brought a check. I have not cashed the check yet, but I promise you I will. There's been so much. EC says, Sam, I know you're using more up-to-date pay systems than me. You have not cashed the check. I sit to help with the film study. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. Haven't been able to make it to the bank. I got the check. I showed it to Vance. I'm going to cash that check. I'm going to add it to the film study fund, which will go on another week, the fundraiser. I want to thank all of your support for the, the film studies. And because of that, we are going to bring the film studies back next year, right? Um, you know, doing some tweaking. I think one of the things I want to do in the off season is, is do a concept series like I talked with, with uh, talked about with Al, where the basic concepts, yeah. the, we can have that. So when we talk about them, week to week if you don't know what it is you can just go back to the concept video that'll have a, a table of contents you can just click it what's cowboy boom you can click it advance going over cowboy what's lightning boom you can click it now you know what he's talking about explain quarter quarter half boom you can click it what's cloud coverage boom you can click so we're, we'll do that concept series not really it will help people more as we go week to week and we won't have to spend time explaining those concepts on a weekly basis. I think that'll be one of the tweaks that we were really looking for um, or that we'll really put into place here in the off season. So we won't be totally gone as far as the film studies are concerned. So appreciate you for helping fund the film studies. If you want to continue to help fund the film study as the campaign goes one more week, be sure to go to that PayPal page, the fund, the film study with Vance Bedford. Uh, I will put that link here in the chat as well as we go on all right all hey, right man. go ahead man. I, I really appreciate all the support more than anything else just to the fans that have bought into watching this it's been a lot of fun for me i want to shout out to that gentleman that i met at the team hotel from jordan he said it took them close to 21 hours to get to the game man and i want to send a shout out to him and jordan it was great meeting you and i wish you the best and hopefully everything's going well with you and your family Absolutely. Appreciate that. Pakistan, man. Ooh, man. In Pakistan. That's that a long flight. That's next level. All right, folks. So again, like I said, if you want to help fund the film study with Vance Beffert, you can do so by <coughs> excuse me, by clicking this PayPal link that is going up in the chat right now. Uh, if you can't see it uh, because you're listening to this in podcast form, don't worry, don't fret. It'll be listed in the description. Uh, and you'll be able to click the link that way. Uh, so we appreciate that. Now, though, it's time to start getting to the questions for Coach Bedford because we know you guys have had some queries that you wanted to get in to Coach Bedford. By the way, there's, there's the uh, the film study link where I find the first question for Vance. All right. This is right in your wheelhouse, Vance. Neil Wiggins wants to know, why did Michigan play so much better defense than Texas than Texas did against Washington fans? Can you explain it, please? <clears throat> it started as number one, it starts up front. Talent-wise up front as a group, they are more, they're more athletic than Texas. Texas is big, they can push the pocket, but they can't move like Michigan can. Michigan scheme, in my opinion, as I said, one of the best schemes I've seen in the nation, coverage-wise, stunt-wise, just the whole package is very complex. Texas is very simple on defense. Michigan does a lot more things, which now it gets more guys loose. 
And again, talent wise, I think overall up front, Michigan had more talent than Texas did. Yeah. Yeah. You and you said that early in the season. Let me shout that out again, too. We were a couple weeks into the season, Vance, when you say, hey, Michigan is more talented up front than Texas. And people were like, whoa, wait a minute. Vance, you were right. I got people in Texas mad at me every time I said it, but as I said before, <laughs> they can't fire me at Texas anymore. <laughs> I'm good as gold. I wish them a best. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh let's see uh adam shepherdson says he thinks elston may deserve a code dc role if all other positions don't work him and clink i think at the very least vance that mike is is gonna get a coordinate like he'll be like run game like van uh clink defensive pass game coordinator or code dc i think i think mike is gonna have uh, a coordinator title uh, next to him because he did a this was a great coaching job he did this year. It's a good chance. If you go back, I think four or five years ago uh, at Notre Dame, and he was up for the DC job at that time, and then Freeman actually got the job instead of Mike. Mm -hmm. And that's when a year later, then Mike comes to uh, Michigan. So he's been in that position close before. So there is a good possibility that that can happen. They can have co coordinators where Mike would actually probably be the guy. Because, again, you can have guys with a title, but one guy has to make those final decisions on what's going on, especially on game day. Mm -hmm. You have input from other coaches, but you have to make that decision. It's, it falls back on you. Mm -hmm. All right. Get back to the questions for Vance. Um, oh yeah, Haji, appreciate you, 1954. So good afternoon, Vance. Fellow fans, happy national championship. Hail to the victors. That's Dennis from the OC. Appreciate you, Dennis. Um, Vance, talk about DB's tackling outside of that, outside of that one missed by Sab, and that was the only one that I can recall in the game. It the the, the tackling was elite, like we talked about earlier. It, it was elite. And think about it, you're in a national championship game. And the one-on-one -on -one tackling in space was absolutely amazing. You go back to the Texas game, Texas missed a bunch, a bunch of tackles. They didn't in Michigan. They played in football position, ready to play, good change of direction and short, short, short every quickness. And they make plays. And they run through guys and don't dive at people. And that showed up. So my hat's off to him. And, and my man, little Mike, one-on-one -on -one open field several times, mm -hmm. he made some tackles like, wow. If he don't make this tackle, it's the first down, a drive, keep going. They got momentum. He stops at one-on-one. -on -one. I'm like, man, this guy, this is impressive. But, you know, I've always been a fan of him. He is anyhow, so. You know, my shout-out to him and all the other guys. Yeah, I got a shout-out to number two, Will Johnson. I talked to him before the game. I think I mentioned this in the post game. I said, Will, what you think, uh, you know, these receivers, they're talking about, you know, they. some people saying they might be a Duns, they might be better than Marvin. He said, man, now you got to know Will don't have no – He he's not like um, some of the some of the talkers on the team. Like, he he don't talk like like Samaj, right? That's He don't get down like that. But he was like, no. He's like, no, Mar Marvin's the best receiver in the country. He said, I watched this dude on film. He's a good player. You know how Will, how calm he is. He's a good player. He said, but no, I just faced the best. And yeah, he made some plays, but I made some plays. That's right. And I, and that's what's going to happen in this game. He might make a few plays, but I'm going to make some plays. Like this dude, I, I, I'm a, I could cover this guy. Advance. <laughs> That play coming out in the third quarter, that was a great interception. I mean, just think about it. I mean, they had, like, it was a cloud corner. He was carrying number one, saw the ball thrown. He came back. That's a guy playing with vision who understands what he had to do, and he made a great play, and that got things going really fast, especially for an offense. So can you explain what happened to the people you, you did during the game? Can you explain what happened at the one time where they, there were a couple times where they had a guy running free? Well, they, okay, they motion, okay, they motion. They had my man, uh, number one, he was to the field. So they motion the guy to the boundary to form a, a stack split. They right on top of each other. So, like, we were rolling to either a half field, and I think it was a double. And so what happened is that the guy on the ball, remember I said that with Marvin, goes deep. So the safety was sitting heavy inside, inside the hash, and Will was sitting outside, the nickelback was little Mike, 
and nobody carried the vertical route. And then, they, they complete when they completed. Yeah, they, they did it twice. One was called back because of a holding call. When they did complete, for about twenty five yard play. And again, about, in both situations, it was a bust. What about the one? And, and speaking of bust, what about the first one where he missed? He had Dunze running wide open. It was the same thing. It was that I was one of the combination was that is that because again they had different coverages. It looked like they were trying to double guys because how the safety was. The safety was two yards inside the hash, like he was waiting for something. And like Will was supposed to be outside deep. First I said, well, he's supposed to be half field, but the way he moved, he moved inside the hash. Mm -hmm. And he did that twice in that particular situation in those checks. So either they had a lack of communication with the bus. I don't know, but we, I think I got that drawn up for, for our, 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 our cutouts. Yeah, one of them was uh, one of them was a he was a cloud and and you caught this actually during the game. We, they, he was a cloud corner and and Rod went to he the went inside, in the inside the hat. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, watching a TV copy, like I said, it, it happened two t two different times. But mm -hmm. I I'll come back to what I said earlier. Thirty coverage variations. I mean, they only had a couple busts in the whole game. I'm not saying that's okay, Coach, because like, I know you don't like making excuses. That's a whole lot of variations, a whole lot of checks they got to make, and they they had two flubs the whole game. And, and to me, though, Sam, when I watch these guys play, the communication is off the chain. The linebacks, the safety, they're talking to each other, they're giving signals, they're looking back. When you watch a lot of teams, you see no communication at all. So they're trying to keep it real simple to take that pressure off of them. But what Jesse did, he put the pressure on the players. He took them as far as they could possibly go, and they, and they went with it. And for the most part, this entire season, it's not many busts out there. And that's very, very rare. And I've been coaching a long time. And those guys did a tremendous job. I mean, they yeah. talked themselves through things. And one time, and I got on, on the telestration, they're in a bunch formation. And I go back to, I said, Texas ran a bunch. They ran a bunch on Washington. Got a guy, Scott Free. These guys worked through this perfectly. And little Mike made the tackle for a five-yard game on like a third down and seven. What Texas gave a big play, Michigan didn't. I mean, so the execution, the communication, how they worked through problems, problem solving was amazing. I mean, I just my hat, man, I'm just my hat's off to these guys. I am very, very impressed. All right. Let's go back to the questions for Vance. Next on the list. Anonymous wants to know, Vance, what do you think of Jesse Minter as our head coach? That's a possibility. That's going to, if, if all ball leaves, that's strictly on, on, on the uh, AD and the president, what they want to do. I mean, when I look at it from this standpoint, you had Sharon Moore be the interim head coach for five ball games. So you got a better chance of Sharon Moore being that guy than Jesse because if it was the other way around, It'd be Jesse who you'd be talking about as a head coach. And, and I could be totally wrong with that. I don't think you're right. But when you look at it, from my perspective, that's how I look at it. Because you know just got an interim head coach. So why? I have no idea why, why Jim did that, but he did. And I think he was preparing Sharon to be a head football coach. And that's what he was doing. You know, I, I think it, it's as simple as time on Taz. Sharon's been here six years. Yeah, you know, coming up from tight ends coach to to O line coach to coordinator to interim head coach in these, uh, you know, really really adversity adversity laden situations, um, you know who who is best equipped to carry on the culture? It's not to say that Jesse can't do it, as we we've, we've talked about what a tremendous coach he is, but I think it's the 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 time invested in the program. Um, I, I think they just feel like he is their best chance to carry on the culture. Yeah. I, I if, if Jim that. leaves. If, if Jim leaves, I mean, it's, I think Sharon would have a great opportunity to be the next head coach there. Uh, I think most of the offensive guys would be back. Uh, I think whether Jim is back or not, I think Jesse, Jesse is gone. I could be totally wrong about that, but if I'm in the NFL, I'm watching this guy. Okay. I'm like, this guy's need to come back. Mm -hmm. Come back to us, to the NFL, and have a chance to be make a coordinator maybe in the NFL. If Mike McDonald's had the success he had, Mike's first year with Baltimore, they weren't very good. 
Second year, he made the adjustments getting back to the league. Now he's interviewing for head coaching job. And I go back to what I said two years ago. I say, Jesse is doing more things and a better job than Mike did. Mm-hmm. And so if I'm looking uh, down to the college ball, and Jesse's been in the NFL already, he's the guy that could be in the NFL and could be a coordinator in the NFL. Mm-hmm. And so, again, if the gym does leave, you know, his brother's going to go with him and Jesse be gone and maybe one other defensive coach. I don't know that. I don't know if he'll take any offensive guys with him. So you can have up to four to maybe five coaches leaving. But mm-hmm. I think there's some guys in place, the analysts you talked about already, that can probably step in in certain places and fill some of those roles. All right. Let's go to the next question for Vance. Uh, as we pull them up, uh, <laughs> hey, this pipe dream you just talked about, it. you said you think he's going anywhere. I, I, I think all you could do is make offer to make him the highest paid coach in in college football uh, coordinator or assistant coach in college football. But talk to me, Vance, about the difference between coaching in college and coaching in the pros. Like if you if you could get paid more money to coach in the pros, I'm are gone. there many coaches that would stay? I'm gone. There's not a doubt in my mind. Well, I don't have to recruit. I don't have to worry about academics. I don't have to worry about NIL. I don't have to worry about the transfer portal. I don't have to worry about it. No state. I, it's a job. I just go to work. I just do football. I don't have to babysit anybody anymore. And you draft guys, you trade for guys. And during your downtime, you have more time off. There's no downtime in college. Why are you recruiting 12 months out of the year right now? You have... Uh, uh, during the month of May, you have kids coming on your campus. You in the month of, uh, I guess it's June, uh, June. You have people coming for official visits. You have no time off. So, from the standpoint of the money's close, you know, coaching college, you go to NFL, and you know, NFL, you're getting a minimum of a two-year contract. If you're a coordinator, you're getting three or four-year contract. And the money for a coordinator in NFL is anywhere from 1.5 to 2.5 million dollars. So, it, it's it's a no-brainer. It's no burden. You can sit back and say, I love this place. Yes, you do. But at the same time, if you ask my wife which more she enjoyed the most, she'll tell you NFL. Why? When I had summer break, there were no recruiting calls. There were no academic problems. There were not guys getting in trouble. I was gone for five weeks. Mm -hmm. I had five weeks off. In college, I had no time off. I'm on my, Sam, I'm on my 25th wedding anniversary. My phone is ringing off the hook by the head coach. You need to call this guy. You need to call that guy. I never had those calls in the National Football League, so it's a no-brainer. Mm-hmm. Uh, Anonymous wants to know, Vance, I'd love to hear your thoughts on Will Johnson and what he does really well. He's a big physical guy. He plays smart. He gets his hands on guys and bump and run. He has great ball skills. He is, he's an excellent guy in space as far as tackling. He has all the attributes you like and the things he does. When I should go and recruit defensive backs, I look for two things. His ball skills. That was very important to me. If you had no ball skills, you better show me something else where I need to recruit you. And then high, his speed. And I tell you one more thing, it's toughness. Mm-hmm. I didn't like guys who weren't very tough. Because on fourth down and five when the game is on the line, that lack of toughness that they show in high school, it shows up in, in, in college too. So those are the three things I look for. If you had no ball skills, you went down, you went down for a while. Because deep balls, if you can't play it, you're asking for trouble right now. And Will can play the deep ball. Tackling, he can do. He can tackle. We walk up the press because he's so big. He gets his hands on guys. It's tough for guys to get around him. So to me, Will is the corner that you look for. Mm-hmm. Another question like that. Nala asks Coach Vance, "What's your assessment of number three, Keon Sav? Do ball, do balled out after he missed the first tackle? <laughs> it's amazing how people always remember the, he can do nine things right, and they talk about the one thing he did wrong." The key thing is that at 90%, he balled out, and he's going to be a good player for us next year. That's the best thing about it is that he played quite a bit this year. He gave us depth. He gave us time on the field. He made plays. So next year, he's ready to take off to the next level because of this year. So his growth, his future is just coming football season. So now he had a tremendous year for us, and the expectation is going to be even more so for this coming year. How about this? BJ Krishna says, Go blue from the islands of Fiji. Man, man we worldwide. He lives in Lawrence <laughs> right there now. <laughs> we worldwide, man. We worldwide. Pakistan, from Pakistan to Fiji. <laughs> Checking us out. That's big time. Appreciate that. Let's go back to the questions for Vance. Uh, Lama Bryant wants to know 
do you think the Washington game plan was negligent because they didn't target Josh Wallace more instead of challenging Mikey and Will? Did Ryan Grubb treat Michigan Michigan's D like Texas? Well, I think they had no idea what Wallace was. Man, Wallace balled out, man. Let's be for real. He might have had his best game in the biggest game of the year. I mean, so trying to find guys, think about this. When I have four guys that's pushing a pocket, how are you going to target anybody? Mm -hmm. You're going to your first read. Whatever your first read is, you're trying to get rid of the football. And that's what he's trying to do. And a lot of times we've had the first read taken out. They tried to go deep on Wallace one time. He was in a great position and made the play. So game plan-wise, they motioned, they shifted, they traded, did everything they did in every other ball game. The difference is, again, I'm making this point, athletically, Michigan's defense was more athletic than Texas' defense. The scheme was, to was totally different. They tried to throw fades on Michigan, didn't. They threw fades on Texas just walking off on the football field. It's like Texas had no idea they were going to throw fades. They just say, hey, go ahead, go down the sideline, I'll give you 45 yards. I mean, what, what were they looking at? So remember, you and I talked about that, right? The pre-show? We did. We did. Say, I'm walking. I'm in practice right now. This is one route they're not going to throw on me. And we yeah. took it away. Texas didn't know they were throwing that route. I looked at five games. I'm like, you take this route away. They like big plays. You make them go down the field a lot of the time. They're not going to be able to beat us. That's not what they're. They're a big play team. We took away the big play. Here's a, a, an interesting question. The New Life says, how do we maintain the culture? If Harbaugh takes two to four coaches with him, think, you know, so let's, let's talk about who who would probably <laughs> go. Jesse, uh, I think Jesse, he he absolutely uh, looked to take Jesse with him. Jay, of course, uh, he looked to take him. I think, you know, the interesting ones to me, because he wouldn't, I don't think he'd take Mike. Um, I think Ron is pretty, it, he, he, I think he talked to Ron, but uh, I think that Ron is, is probably uh, staying at Michigan. The, the, a couple of the interesting ones are Grant Newsom, who the word was he was looking to take with him before he made him an assistant at Michigan. He was uh, looking to maybe take him with him to Minnesota. And Mike, Mike Elston, you know, uh, with the coaching job he did, you know, I think the respect for, for Mike is on a on another level. Um, You know, the, there's talk that he might that he would ask Mike to go with him. So, you know, let's say you kept everybody else. You know, how this new life is saying, how do you maintain the culture if he takes, you know, a handful of coaches with him? A first question is a strength coach going with him. So the strength coach, there's a good chance of retaining him. Ben Herbert, there, 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 there are two things that go into that. One is he's making a million dollars a year. Man, you've been in the league. Strength coaches don't make that in the NFL. No. That's number one. You know, the, the the role of the strength coach, this is something Brian Cook from Go Blog brought up. He said, man, the strength coach, his profile in a college program is way different. That's number two. And then number three, his kids, man. You know, he he has kids that, you know, this is often a consideration for a lot of coaches that are at the age where, you know, if, if they can stay put and, and, and finish out school with their friends and that kind of thing, that's where Herb is with, with his kids. Right now, so you got three really big factors, and he loves Michigan. You got three really big factors that aid in if Jim leaves Sharon's ability to retain him. So I would give Michigan the edge and keep him Ben Herbert. If you keep the strength coach, he is your culture. That comes from the head coach because he has his hands on the players more than any coach in the program. He has them all the time. During the offseason, recruiting when coaches on the road, guess who's around all the time? Strength coach. So it starts with there. So if he can keep that guy, that's key. Now, Sharon has been with, with uh, Jim for a while. So certain things are going to stay the same. If you can keep certain guys around to understand that culture, it's going to be different because you have a different guy in charge, but you have some of the things stay the same. And then the guys that you bring in, they need to fit on the thing that you believe in. If not, you can't bring them in because they become a distraction. They got to buy into what's there already. If they're willing to do that, I think you'd be all right. I always say this about coach. If you're a head football coach, if you lose a guy, the guy you bring in needs to be better than the guy you lost. Because those kids can relate to the previous guy that lost. So 
you got to come in and bring something different that I can make you a better player than what you were before. Mm -hmm. If you don't, then the program is going in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Now, me personally, is talking about Jesse Minner. He's tough to replace. There's not many guys out there like Jesse. I'm just going to be honest with you. And to replace him, it's going to be difficult, but it has to be done. Okay, I'll go back to when Greg Madison left and Jesse and uh, Jim Herman became a coordinator. Oh, it's going to be a big loss. What? He ended up winning a doggone uh, award for a coach of the year. We won a national championship. So we didn't miss a beat. But the system, the culture stayed the same because the head coach was the same, the strength coach was the same, so on and so forth. But you're going to have a major change, so it's going to be some adjustments. You're losing some key players. That's an adjustment. You had great leadership this year. Look at the seniors you have leaving. The quarterback that you have leaving. Been in the program three years. He got better and better each year. He led you that way. You're losing a running back. Blake, great leader. And that that's the part that people are not talking about. It's great talking about the coaches. I'm also thinking about the players that left. They are your culture. They prepared the guy that came behind them. Can the senior class coming up right now do the same thing this senior class is leaving had done? Yeah. I So, you know, people are really down that I've been talking to, and you have been too, that they're, almost certainly going to lose mentor. Maybe they feel a little bit better that we say, I think they have a great chance at keeping Ben Herbert. Like, I don't think Michigan's going to lose both of those guys. So from a culture standpoint, to your point, Ben Herbert is a big part of the culture yeah. of the team. So that's but a great you know what? You should hope that my program is so great that I'm losing coaches to take the next step up. If you have a head coach, he should have one job. It's to win, but it's also to develop his players, to be an extension of mom and dad. Also, he want a coaching staff that he's going to build up. They continue to grow and move on to become coordinators or head coaches that go to the National Football League. Mm -hmm. If you have a quality head coach, that's what he should want for his staff. I, I don't know Coach Harbaugh at all. And I honestly believe that he is that type of guy that develops guys to move on to do better things and they continue to build and replace those guys. If he leaves, I think Sharon Moore could do the same thing. The only difference is you're losing a lot of key football players right now, and that makes it tough. And, and you're losing a coordinator in Jesse Minister. That's going to make it tough. The season, the teams you got to play going to be a lot more difficult. you got better teams from the West Coast. Come, I think we could be play Oregon, I believe. We play Oregon and USC along with Ohio State. So that's going to be different. So it's a lot of things that's changing for whoever. If Jim stays, that would be great. But whoever's going to be the next head coach of Jim Lee's, he's in a tough situation because all of a sudden you had three not good years but great years to finish with a national championship. So no matter what happens, people are going to be a little bit disappointed. If you, if you look at the, the uh, Twitter and Dennis game, people were complaining then. You know, I, I get pissed off. You know, you know I get. I'll be blowing them up. I tell you, <laughs> get off the fence, go support somebody else. Get behind them or get out of the way. I could care less because you know what? People cry about the wind blew the wrong way. Oh, we're gonna lose. Oh, we so, so Sharon Moore can't call plays. Hot ball should call. I mean, man, give me a break. Grow up, people. Adjustments, change, and loss is part of life. So get behind. Let's go blue and keep things rolling. Only time for a couple more here with Van Soul MC Detroit. Made it over from the other breakdown. He said, what is the ceiling for Kenneth Grant, Mason Graham, and the D-line next season? The squad lost a lot of depth, but they're returning guys up front are beasts. Appreciate Coach Vance, the best in the game. I'll tell you what, we lost a lot of depth. These guys here, in my opinion, are stars. They're going to be – this going to be the last year for those two guys. They're going to play one more year. They're going to the league. The biggest thing is I don't know any of the guys that are behind them. I really don't. I mean, so you're losing some key guys. But initially, up front for our starters, I think we could be special on defense again. The biggest thing is do we have depth to overcome injuries like we had this year? This year we had some injuries, and the guys who stepped in did a tremendous job. Did a tremendous job. Yeah, Rayshon Benny, number 26, who got hurt at the end of the season. He was one of the ones who stepped into the lineup when Mason Graham got hurt during the mm -hmm. season. Expect for him to take a step up. Another guy uh, out on the edge they talk about is uh, kid TJ Guy who they feel like is ready to take a step. So there are some guys in the background that they are expecting to, to take a step up to get, help give them that depth mm -hmm. that they had last year. Now, will their depth be as talented as the depth was this year? I think that's going to be hard, man. That, no, that's, that's no, it won't be. It won't be. 
I, I bet it's going to be hard. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm honest, man. I mean, the depth they had, whoo, I mean, I had no idea that they had guys that could play that way, and they just kept rolling them in. Everybody can do that. And think about it. We don't have we don't have 35-star guys on a team like Georgia and Alabama and Texas. We don't. I mean, you, my man Graham come out of uh, California, three-star guy in a wrestler. And he's better than any of those guys we can talk about right now. So nice. Nice. So. Yeah. All right, Van. <laughs> uh, we'll make this be – or these last two be the last ones. Um, the New Life says, what are Vance's – what's Vance's appraisal of Makari Page number seven? What do you think of – a Makari, who's coming back for his fifth year of safety. He did some good things as the season went on. I thought he made some plays uh, earlier in the year. I had major questions about our safety play. I mean, I really did. I mean, but as the things got come along, it seems like he started picking things up. The depth, the playmaking ability, been in the right spots, making checks. So, again, I think he, he's going to be fine. He'll be okay. I think he's one of their more physical players mm -hmm. uh, in the secondary. Like that, that dude. You you feel him. You feel him in the run game. Uh, there was a play. I want to say this again. You might remember this play, Vance. Uh, he came up last year against. I think it was against UConn, and he blew up a guard. You might. He blew up. A, so he didn't make the play, but he blew up the guard as the guard was coming up. Uh, you know, to 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 block him. He he took the guard out in the play. And then I think a linebacker came through to, to make a tackle. I was like, man, for this dude, for a safety to come up and, and hit a guard in the chest and knock him back, like that dude is physical. And I, I saw that physicality over the course of the, not just that year, but more so even this year. My biggest thing is, is we tackled extremely well this year in space. And I look at those teams coming from the West Coast that so we got to play Oregon. Guess what they do? They spread you out. Mm -hmm. USC, they spread you out. So we're going to be more – Spread out. You play Ohio State, they're going to spread you out. So you're going to have more teams with better athletes that's going to spread us out. So in space, we got to be excellent tacklers this coming season. But that's this coming season. Right now, we're still enjoying what we are right now with a national championship. No, no matter what anybody says, my man got his 500-page uh, uh, manifesto. We're good with that. We still <laughs> got a smash burger. We're good with that. <laughs> so you know what? I am good to go. They can say what they want to say, but at the end of the day, we did what we were supposed to do when we needed to do it, and the rest is history. That is right. Last one. Franklin Sollers. Coach Klink seems brilliant at his job. Like Coach Minter, Minter he has a defensive back mentality. I think Klink would have learned enough to carry on uh, Minter's defense. I certainly think he'd be in the mix, fans. As you said earlier, he and Mike Elston together, they, they know the system. They understand what's going on. And you mentioned my man Mallory. Again, he's there in the system, too. You have three guys that can really keep that system going the way it is at the present time. So he's right about that. But, again, the guy who, play, who, who has actually called plays, going in there inexperienced and, and, and the big town with the people coming in, not the easiest thing to do. Mm -hmm. You never called plays before. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a different year now. It's not the old Big Ten, 12, and 21 person there. You're not playing uh, Michigan State. You're going to play Michigan State with a guy going to spread you out the way he came from. He's another West Coast guy. They're going to spread the field. So you're going to play four teams that's going to spread you out. They're going to make you play in space and it, more than anything we did this past season. You know, uh, real quick, one of the names that people were asking me about on the message board, they must be watching this going back years when we were talking about defensive coordinator. Somebody came on the board and said, Hey, what about that guy Clint Hurt from from Seattle? So tell yeah. me, I know you know Clint. So so what about tell tell me about Clint? Tell the folks about Clint about what kind of coach he is. Great coach, uh, great recruiter. I, you know, I work with Greg Madison and Clint Hurt. Different personality reminds me a lot of Greg as far as fundamentals, teaching it, going to recruit. He was a special recruiter in my opinion. He's a DCSC out on, and you know, uh, the head coach. I mean, they kind of forced him out, so he's definitely available. And I don't think he can go wrong. I mean, you bring a guy like that, he's been an NFL now for seven, seven years now. He's been a coordinator now for th three years, I believe. So he'll be an excellent fit. I mean, he's gonna bring, I tell you what, he, my man's intense now. Oh, man. The players will flat love a guy like that. So I have no idea if, if 
if, if Jim would leave, as he's in the mix at all, if, uh, Sharon knows him because Sharon worked with him at Louisville, but I have no idea. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know how they came up with his name, but, you know. He certainly if, did. If it did, he, he is a good one to take a look at. I got you. All right, folks, that is going to do it for this edition of the Michigan Football Breakdown. Remember, the film studies are coming up on Monday. All right, so we'll publish them on Monday. Promise you we would give you the full X's and O's breakdown of the game. We are going to do that. We ask you to help fund the film study. You did that. And because you helped fund the film studies, we're going to bring them back next year. We're even going to go here in the offseason, do some concept videos so you can have the concepts as a key to when we're breaking down plays next season. You go back and check the concept video for any questions that you might have. And I'm going to try to talk to the people at Fox. Like, come on, man. Like, we got to work this out so we can try to make some. <laughs> we, we spend so much time on these videos, man. We, we, you got to let us make some kind of some kind of hay. So we're going to talk to them about that. <laughs> Excuse uh, me. They need to get better commentators. So I want to talk about them how bad they are. That's part of the problem. They can't be talking. About so next year, the next season, I want to talk about the commentators. Even though they're awful sometimes, I won't mention them so they leave us alone. You think that's what it is, man? Yeah, it has to be, man, because when you tell the truth about how bad they are, they get upset. <laughs> and I just told the truth what I saw. I mean, the, the people who watch the game got to see the same thing. That's why I turn the volume off. The people, they, they are clue analysts. Not clues, but clue analysts sometimes. It just gives me a headache sometimes. I hear these guys talk, and they're supposed to be football people. Give me a break. They need to get a different job. <laughs> All right, folks, so be on the lookout for the film studies on Monday. Until then, thanks for watching another edition of the Michigan Football Breakdown, focused on the defense with Vance Beffer. Go Blue.